the jury. Dana, we're learning a lot more about how he allegedly helped fudge some financial documents to lower Paul Manafort's overall tax bill. One of Manafort's former accountants named Cindy Laporta delivered some damaging testimony saying she was, quote, disturbed by what she believed to be false information on the Manafort tax reforms that she uh, returns that she did submit anyway. And that Rick Gates once sent her a Microsoft Word document that she knew right away was probably fake, but she used it anyway to convince a bank that a million and a half dollar loan in Manafort's account had actually been forgiven. The Mueller team alleges these wire transfers weren't loans at all, but just Manafort moving money from overseas accounts to the U.S. and claiming they were loans so he could avoid paying income taxes on them right away. The Manafort defense team claims that he never willingly broke any tax laws, though. Dana. Peter, what else are we expecting this week? I think this is the second full week of the trial. I, today, court started about a half an hour later than planned, but the Mueller team has been saying that they plan to rest their case. They plan to lay out everything that they've got against Paul Manafort and rest by the end of this week. We do expect to see Rick Gates, Manafort's former partner, on the stand at some point before they do rest their case, but we don't know how many of the other 21 witnesses on the Mueller team's witness list of possibilities for the stand are actually going to wind up testifying. The Manafort defense team has been keeping their cards very close to the vest, but their client is definitely keeping a close eye on the allegations against him. He sits in court, Paul Manafort does, taking very detailed notes of uh, just about everything that a witness says and uh, just about all of the exhibits that are introduced against him. So we don't know how involved Mr. Manafort is in shaping the defense based on what they're hearing from the prosecution, but the defense team is going to have their chance, we believe, at some point this week uh, to try to clear his name. Dana. All right, Peter Ducey, thank you. More on this now with James Trusty. He's former Justice Department prosecutor and IFRA law partner. Um, what is the prosecution's strategy here with Rick Gates? Well, it's to kind of bury him in the middle. Uh, you hope as a prosecutor that the rest of your case is very strong, that the paper trail and the bookkeepers can kind of establish your tax fraud independently. But you want to put Gates in to establish a conspiracy. You want to nail it home, and you hope that somehow his credibility survives the attacks that are coming. Yeah, I, I know that you think that Gates could get scorched by the defense. How so? Well, I mean, look, any cooperating defendant has some built-in cross-examination that comes with that. Uh, they're going to basically say you're out to save your own skin, that you've essentially betrayed your friend and confidant and partner uh, by, by joining Team America and going after him. One of the aggravators here, however, is that apparently in some of the first meetings that uh, Mr. Gates had with the government, he continued to be dishonest. It's not the first time that's happened, believe me. But that adds some additional baggage because the cross-examination really ramps up and talks about how you lied to these agents, you lied to these prosecutors, but they still want you on their team. And so you kind of put the prosecution on trial a little bit when, you, when the prosecutor has a, a cooperator with a track history of lying to his face. With the accountant that Peter Ducey was reporting on, she testified on Friday. Um, she said that she felt like it was wrong, but she did it anyway. Is she in any sort of trouble? Well, uh, it sounds like not. Um, I mean, one of the tactics you can do as a prosecutor is just basically say, look, I'm viewing you as a witness. I'm not making you any promises. And you get up on the stand and tell the truth. The person gets up on the witness stand and they're kind of hard to impeach by, by cross-examination because they say, I could mm -hmm. still be charged. Mm. Um, and they're kind of twisting in the wind a little bit, but it gives them some credibility. But how I, I know there's a number that were immunized. She might have been one of them. How awkward is it for the defendant to be there, Paul Manafort, and then somebody like Rick Gates, they were colleagues for a long time, partners, and now um, obviously on opposite sides of this very high stakes trial. How awkward is that for the lawyers that are in the room as well? Well, I mean, look, the, that's, again, pretty common uh, in federal cases to see cooperators who had some sort of pre-existing relationship with the defendant. So they're probably not going to give each other a little fist bump or high five as they pass. Um, but I wouldn't expect a lot of theater either. Most likely Manafort's attorneys have said, do not react, Just do not in. do anything, but take your notes and let him do his thing. I want to change topics really quickly because this trial we're talking about is not about collusion in any way. Um, the story, though, um, that the White House 
And President Trump's lawyers are still thinking about whether they would work with Mueller uh, to find some accommodation for an interview of some sort or written answers. Rudy Giuliani, the president's top lawyer, saying that they will make that decision in the next day and a half or so. Um, but listen also to uh, the other Trump lawyer, Jay Sekulow, talking about the Donald Trump Jr. meeting at Trump Tower and how he says he had wrong information. I want to get your take on this. Watch. There was a lot of information that was gathering, and as my colleague Rudy Giuliani said, uh, I, had, I had bad information at that time. I made a mistake in my statement. As far as when did we correct it, the important part is the information that we've shared with the Office of Special Counsel. I'm not going to get into the details, but we were very clear as to uh, the situation involving that trip uh, and, the, and the statements that were made to the New York Times. Is there any, anything uh, at all to be done or said about um, the Trump team saying they had bad information from the president's son? Yeah, you know, I think their message has been so scattered that it's kind of hard to take any of it uh, all that seriously at this point. I mean, the message that comes out has been very inconsistent from the White House. I understand it's a pretty difficult situation in terms of your client uh, being on Twitter all day long, but uh, they need to just maybe have a single message and convey that consistently all right, and not well, overreact. Wait, James, are you new here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. Let me ask you about one other thing, yeah. because you uh, have worked in the government. You've worked on prosecutions. Tell me about the use of um, false statements and how it applies here in this case and how maybe it didn't apply to Hillary Clinton and her team. Well, I think that's a real interesting dynamic here. You know, 1001, 18 U.S.C. 1001 is the section that's uh, charged for false statements to law enforcement. And in the OIG report dealing with the Hillary Clinton email probe, they specifically talked about how they knew witnesses were lying. Uh, but James Comey himself specifically said, we're just not going to waste our time doing these 1,001s. We're either going to get a, a lead target or we're not. Well, somehow that's completely reversed here. In the case that we're talking about now, where it's the Trump probe, 1,001s are being given out like Pez dispensers. I mean, there's a, there's a whole slew of them. And I think it's an unusual kind of use of discretion for them to swear it off in one high-profile public corruption yeah. investigation, but to use it quite freely in the other one. It is curious indeed. James Trustee, thank you. Sure. Thanks, Dana. As President Trump signs an executive order to reimpose sanctions on Iran tonight, after the Trump administration withdrew from the 2015 nuclear deal, Ambassador John Bolton says this action had to be taken an indication of how strongly we feel that the Iranian nuclear weapons program, its ballistic missile program, its support for terrorism, its belligerent activity in the Middle East have to stop. Joining me now is Rich Edson at the State Department. Rich, we're now hearing from Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani. What did he have to say? Uh, we are data, and the Iranian president is essentially responding to President Trump's offer to have a meeting. Hassan Rouhani says that he believes the president's offer is insincere. It's simply a made-for-television moment, and he thinks it's an attempt to divide the Iranian people. This is on the same day as the administration is announcing that it will move forward to essentially undo the Iran nuclear deal from the U.S. perspective. The sanctions that the United States lifted as part of the Iran nuclear deal, many of them will go back into effect at midnight tonight. These are measures that target Iran's dealing in U.S. dollars, Iran's currency abroad, its business in precious metals, aluminum and steel, coal, and Iran's auto sector. That's only phase one. In less than three months, the administration will reimpose even more sanctions that the U.S. had suspended as part of this deal. That hits Iran's central bank and its oil production. Senior administration officials say the protests in Iran, a slowing economy, and a dramatic fall in Iran's currency value shows that even the threat of these sanctions is already hitting Iran. Senior administration officials say they're trying to cut off Iran's funding of militias operating around the Middle East and other international interventions and convince its leadership to change its behavior, Dana. So, uh, tell me about the Europeans. I understand they oppose these new sanctions. Now, they do, along with Iran, China, and Russia, all the other countries that are still trying to hold the Iran nuclear agreement together. Specifically, the U.S. allies, Britain, Germany, and France, put out a statement earlier today saying, quote, we're determined to protect European economic operators engaged in legitimate business with Iran, the preservation and maintenance of the effective financial channels with Iran, and the continuation of Iran's export of oil and gas. On these, as other topics, our work continues, including with third countries interested in supporting the JCPOA and maintaining economic relations with Iran. 
But the Wall Street Journal is now reporting, citing U.S. officials, that Germany is moving forward with a proposal that would essentially block a 300 billion euro transfer of money out of a bank in Germany. That's something that the U.S. certainly would want to see as the United States is lobbying Germany and other countries to cut off ties, business ties, with Iran data. All right, Rich Edson, thank you so much. An attempt on the life of Venezuela's president, how he was targeted and who he's blaming. Plus, an enormous fireball rips through a major freeway in Italy. Hear what led to this deadly accident. And Georgia officials warned about the security of its voting machines before the 2016 elections. What that could mean for the midterms and how lawmakers are trying to safeguard the systems. I think the one area where both the Congress and local officials and the federal government and local officials need to be working together is to be sure that whatever happens on election day, mm -hmm. there is confidence that that's what really happened. New concerns about voting in Georgia after emails show election officials were aware of weaknesses in the system before the 2016 elections. The man in charge, Secretary of State Brian Kemp, now running for governor, facing criticisms about the state's vulnerability to hackers as we get closer to the midterm. So I'm joined now by Marianne Marsh, former senior advisor to Secretary of State John Kerry. Um, so the allegations or the emails show that they knew they had some problems back in 2016. Now going forward, the state um, attorney general, or the secretary of state, mm -hmm. Brian Kemp, so he's in charge, but he's also running for governor, and he has set up a state-level commission for 2020. Is that good enough for Democrats? Well, it shouldn't be good enough for any citizen of Georgia who wants to make sure that when they vote, their vote is counted and counted accurately. And that's why voting shouldn't be left just up to the states. It shouldn't be left up to one secretary of state who was warned of the problems, did nothing to fix them in 2016, doing nothing to fix it today, and doing nothing to prevent it in November of this year when everybody goes to the polls. This is also a national security issue. So we need the full force of the federal government to come in and help all these states from being hacked by Republicans. Now, you may have thought from that press conference last week the federal government's on the watch it looked like it it looked like it but none of them are working together they're each doing their own thing no one's in charge the person who should be in charge is john bolton who is not leading this effort so now you have a system where likely they could overlook things fail and that's bad for Although everybody. he probably inherited it but even going back further so in 2016 the trump people weren't in charge right and you didn't see that kind of a show of force at the white house with all of those top officials saying we're on top of this that's right, and a big mistake by the Barack Obama administration and by then President Obama. They did try to warn people, ended up on the day of the infamous now Access Hollywood tape, but they did not do enough to make sure that the election in 2016 was fair and counted fairly and the Russians were stopped from hacking it. That is something they're going to have to own for years to come, but that is no excuse for the Trump administration not to do better than they are there, today. Um, there are several states that only have electronic-only systems, no paper ballots, so if there is a concern, you can't even go back as Georgia, Delaware, Louisiana, Louisiana, New Jersey, and South Carolina. Um, partial voting includes Pennsylvania, Texas, Kansas, Florida, Tennessee, Arkansas, Indiana, Kentucky, and Mississippi. That's a lot of places that need help. They were given, um, Congress approved $380 million for states. Not all this money has been used. Not all this has been, uh, they're not using it uniformly either. Is that a problem? That is a problem. And a bigger problem was Congress, the Republicans in Congress last week, zero funded it. There was supposed to be another $250 million. $380 million is woefully short for what we need to do to make sure that the November 6 election is fair and the Russians don't hack them. Remember, they were here in 2016. They have not left. They're, elect they're now hacking more than our election. Well, and that's what, they, I mean, they did say that from the White House last just last week. But again, no, this is not a coordinated effort. It shouldn't be left to the states. It's a national security okay. issue. If I could switch gears on yep. one thing, because uh, big picture uh, Democratic politics, I wanted to ask you about, you know, um, remember, it's the economy, stupid. Mm -hmm. And I think that that bears out. But Robert Samuelson, the columnist of The Washington Post, wrote today, economic anxiety is increasingly an equal opportunity affliction. No one can escape it. The poor worry about staying poor. The lower middle class worries about paying bills or losing jobs. Now, upper middle class parents have joined the crowd because their own well-being is often judged by how well their children are doing. So I wondered if it's the financial anxiety, stupid, um, might be a more apt description. And do you think that anyone in the 2020 Democratic field is thinking about this and able to sort of tap into that anxiety and address it? It's a great question, Dana. I think they all are, and especially when you see some of the people who appeared at Netroots last week in a very progressive group where a lot of 
potential 2020 uh, candidates appeared took different cuts at that. But the fact is, when you look at life and upward mobility, it's always been based on the same pillars. If you get a good education, you get a good job, then you can have good health care and good benefits and affordable housing. Those four pillars have been blown apart. And how Democrats and Republicans answer that question, can you have affordable housing and can you have health care that people can afford and cover you? Can you get a good paying job that really pays you the kinds of wages that you need to afford these things? And how Those can, all need to be fixed. How do you think the Democrats are doing in pushing back against what is, by all accounts, a really good economy that Trump is overseeing. Well, it may look good in the numbers, and especially if you're wealthy in the stock market, For but most people in this country, their wages aren't keeping up with the price of goods and costs, and that's before the taxes and tariffs kick in from Trump. Everyone's struggling. All right. Marianne Marsh, thanks for being oh, here. Nice in studio, even. In studio. All right. Protesters out in force this weekend targeting a controversial Florida law. A live report coming up. Plus, one of California's biggest agricultural exports is being threatened and is probably not what you think. That story is up next. Fox News alert. Rick Gates has been spotted inside the courthouse at the Paul Manafort trial. Gates is a former aide to Manafort. He's expected to be the government's star witness after he cut a plea deal. So we'll keep an eye on that. <laughs> President Trump's trade war with China taking a bite out of America's pistachio farmers. China hitting back at the president's steel and aluminum tariffs, taking aim at one of California's major crops in a region where Republicans are vulnerable. William Lajeunesse is live in California with more. William. Well, Dana, it is a little bit like a game of chicken. You have these two giant trading partners racing towards economic suicide over tariffs. And politically, it is no accident that China is picking on farmers. From California fields to Beijing markets, a prolonged trade war hurts both. China represents over a billion dollar market for us. China, you know, typically buys about 30 percent of the pecans grown in the United States. The big worry right now is what happens if we're in a prolonged dispute. At a recent California Food Expo, the Trump trade war took center stage. China is the state's third largest export market. You name it, we grow it here. Since April, China slapped new tariffs on two billion in California commodities, 45 percent on pistachios, 53 percent on grapes, 65 percent walnuts. No grower likes to see tariffs imposed. Out of the thousands of products that China imports from the United States, why pistachios and almonds? Well, one reason, pressure. While California voted for Clinton, four of the five largest nut producing counties voted for Trump. If they feel the pain, he feels the pressure. You look at congressional districts, what's grown in that district and who the leadership is. Which includes House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy from Bakersfield and vulnerable Central Valley Republicans, Jeff Denham, David Villato, and Devin Nunez. They know they can, where they first attack is where they know that they're going to hear from the folks and California agriculture definitely is very vocal when it comes to these issues. So the worry is a ripple effect through the supply chain, trucking, processing, ports, which explains, Dana, why many worry that tariffs on something as small as a pistachio or a walnut can choke the golden goose. Dana? But, William, is China's retaliation having any political <clears throat> impact that is noticeable? It is now. In fact, farm groups have joined together, Farmers for Free Trade. They're uh, airing 1.5 million in ads this week, telling the president to back off, exerting the pressure that China wanted. So saying they can't handle losing the China market, even though many agree with the president that China doesn't play fair. Back to you. All right, William, thank you for that report. Political analysts closely watching a special election in Ohio tomorrow. The House seat is up for grabs in a traditionally Republican district for President Trump stumping for Troy Balderson on Saturday. If you want to have a border, if you want to stop the radical Pelosi and Waters, Maxine Waters agenda, there's only one choice in this election. That's vote for Troy Balderson. Some key primaries across the country tomorrow with voters heading to the polls in Kansas, Michigan, Missouri, and Washington, plus the special election in Ohio's 12th Congressional District. 
And that special election has a big spotlight on it. President Trump stumping for Troy Balderson on Saturday. The district has been in Republican hands for years, but a recent Monmouth University poll has Balderson leading by only one point over Democrat Danny O'Connor for the vacant House seat. Let's go to Kristen Fisher in Columbus. Kristen, why is this race getting so much attention? Well, Dana, this is the last special election before the midterms. It's also shaping up to be a very tight race in what should be a solidly red district. The current congressman who won this seat, a Republican, he won it by 37 points. Romney won it by 10 points. President Trump won it by 11 points. The last time a Democrat won this seat was way back in 1980. So if the Republican candidate, Troy Balderson, loses, it would be a very big deal. It could also spell potentially big trouble for Republicans heading into the midterm. So that's why we have seen this parade of top Republicans flooding into the district. The vice president came here twice, House Speaker Paul Ryan, the state's governor, John Kasich, and the state's senior senator. They have all come here. And then over the weekend, of course, we saw President Trump come here and personally campaign on Troy Balderson's behalf. And President Trump knows that this race is going to be all about turnout. So he really tried to energize his supporters and get them to vote on Tuesday. A vote for Troy's opponent is a vote for open borders, which equals massive crime. Like, they don't care about it. They don't care about the crime. They don't care about your military, and they don't care about your vets. Now, his opponent is Democrat Danny O'Connor, a 31-year-old, and he's been running on a very centrist platform. He's been very critical very careful not to criticize President Trump too much. It's very clear that he's trying to win over those Republicans who have become very unhappy with President Trump and his policies, Dana. Kristen, I understand the governor of Ohio has expressed concern that Trump's support could do more harm than good in this district. How does the candidate feel about that? Well, if he agrees with the governor, he is certainly not saying it. I asked him that very question yesterday, and he told me that he has no concerns whatsoever about President Trump stumping on his behalf. But I also asked him, you know, are there any policies, any of the president's policies that you disagree with? He cited the president's policy of separating families at the border, and he also potentially cited his tariffs. Listen here. Ag in this district is very important and agriculture is the number one industry here, industry here in the state of Ohio. Uh, so I'm watching those tariffs and, and what impact they could have. But that's what I'm gonna, I, I have a farming background. So Dana, this is going to be a true fight to the finish. One month ago, the Monmouth University poll that everybody's been watching here, it gave Balderson a 10 point lead. Now that lead has shrunk to just one point. This is going to be very tight. Both candidates working very hard all the way until election day, which is just hours away now. Yeah, they better sprint to the finish. All right, Kristen, thank you. For more on this, let's bring in our political panel. Ty Matzdorf worked on the Obama re-election campaign. He was also the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee's executive director for 2016. Nan Hayworth is the former New York Congresswoman and a member of the Independent Women's Forum Board of Directors, high, highly qualified, of course. <laughs> I saw today these headlines about this race. Yeah. Any special election is like the most important thing. It's the biggest thing. It's going to be the bellwether. But Ty, why is this race so close now? Uh, I think that you're just seeing a backlash to Trump. I mean, uh, Americans fundamentally want a divided government. And I think that what they're seeing from Trump is not the progress that they wanted. And it's getting closer and closer. And look, there's energy on the Democratic side and maybe not as much on the Republican side. And that's what balances out the fact that there's actually more Republicans in the district. Does it have anything to do with get out the vote campaigns? Because I'm curious yeah. about that registering of new mm -hmm. voters. Yeah, a lot of it is, look, we have seen a surge in people registering for the first time to vote since Donald Trump was elected. Mm -hmm. A lot of that is backlash to him, but a lot of that is his supporters. And this is what the Republicans are doing. That's why Pence is there, Portman, Kasich, mm -hmm. Trump himself, because they need these Republicans to turn out or else there's just not enough bodies to offset the Democratic enthusiasm. Yeah. Well, and, and the Republicans have certainly been willing to spend on this race. I mean, oh, yeah. record amount of money, a lot of firepower. Absolutely. And there is a theory that the Republicans th float out there that they're going to possibly lose this race. Only
only to win it and then to say, well, actually, see, President Trump is more popular than you thought. Well, yes, uh, you know, it's it's important to, to set expectations properly. One interesting observation, you know, there are, and uh, Ty has pointed out, there are a lot of forces coming together here. We have a booming economy, but almost to the point at which folks are perhaps even starting to take that for granted a bit. You know, Republicans may be becoming complacent and saying, well, now we can adjust on some other things. But I watched Troy Balderson, you know, the candidate can make a difference. Uh, and I'm sure he's a fine, fine man. Uh, but he, he he's reading his speech at this great Trump rally. He may not be quite as energetic and charismatic as his young opponent, who actually has reversed himself on supporting Nancy Pelosi. Mm. Now, he, you know, he actually said he would. But that's an interesting thing, because Nancy Pelosi is the entity that Republicans love to run mm -hmm. against. It works for them some places. Will it work here? Well, we'll, we'll find out tomorrow. Um, but if it doesn't, then the Republicans have now thrown out two playbooks. The first playbook was we're going to run positive all on the tax cuts. They haven't spoken hardly one word about the tax cuts in they their really paid media in Ohio 12. Then they're out in the special. Then they said, all right, we're going to run against Pelosi. That's what they're trying now. If that doesn't work again, it didn't work in PA 17. They blame Rick Saccone. If it doesn't work here, they've got 89 days to figure out a new playbook. But let me also ask you this. Whoever wins these two in this race tomorrow, mm -hmm. do these same two people run again yes. in mm -hmm. November, yes. three months yeah. from now? Yes. So how much money yeah. might that oh, yeah. cost? Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, you go please. Ahead, well, I was just going to oh, say, yeah, the so Republicans point. will be right in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know that, Ty. And they'll have learned the lessons of this election. And I, uh, to be honest, in the general, this probably doesn't get as much attention. Like you said, this is right. much bigger than any one election. In, in November, it's one of 100. Right now, this is going to set the narrative. This is going to dictate fundraising. So it's not going to get this, to be honest. Could we talk about one other race, though, because yes, there's please. these other places in Missouri. I wanted yeah. to talk about this candidate, Cori Bush. Mm -hmm. She's a 41-year-old pastor and single mm -hmm. mother. She's challenging Representative Lacey Clay mm -hmm. in Missouri's 1st District. Mm -hmm. She's running on a very progressive platform, Medicare for all, abolishing ICE, a $15 minimum wave. But she says she does not call herself a democratic socialist. Mm -hmm. If elected, she would become Missouri's first black congresswoman. What kind of recruiting has the DCCC done here for a district like this? And does she have a chance of winning it? My guess is the DCCC is not involved here because this is a very safe democratic seat. Um, and we don't typically get involved in primaries, particularly mm -hmm. in safe seats. But look, uh, Congressman Clay has to figure out what every person when their name is on the ballot is. How do I relate to my voters? And where's the energy of my voters? And Maybe they don't agree on everything, but they have got to figure that out. Like that is that is the price of admission if you want to put your name on the ballot. And does he need to fear an Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Joe Crowley situation as because uh, happened in New York? Mm -hmm. Right. And, mm -hmm. and Ocasio-Cortez has been there to campaign for Cori Bush. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to get energy on the Democratic Socialist side. Mm -hmm. if, um, if Danny O'Connor pulls this mm -hmm. out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. What will the message then be from the Democrats? I've already said that they, the Republicans have lowered expectations. Mm -hmm. The Democrats, have they raised expectations too high or do you think they're just right? Uh, I think they're about right. Like our financial commitment, the, the Democrats financial commitment's been about right. It's a hard thing because it is. But what the Democrats have been saying is, look, there are 60 more competitive districts in this. So if for some reason, Daniel Connor does win. The um, the talking point going forward would be look at all our past to now 22 seats to the yeah. majority. Yeah. One thing I did want to ask you is about this. You know, John Kasich, the governor there saying, you know, I don't know if it's going to help for President Trump to come into this district. But President Trump needs to do a couple things. One, he needs to be visible in Ohio. Ohio. It's an important state for him. He needs to turn out his base to vote for Balderson. Absolutely. But also, does he run the risk of turning off some of these uh, independents or energizing the Democratic sure. base? It's a real difficult balance. Dana, you are right. And it is all in the president's hands. And the president has proven to be a gifted campaigner in so many ways. Um, I think if he if he merely could adjust his message just a bit so that he emphasizes, as Ty has also said, the economic accomplishments and the essential nature